My name is Lovis Arnadotir. I'm the communications manager for Samorka, and I'm honored to be the session chair for the opening. So, let's get to it. First, I'd like to welcome to the stage the Icelandic Minister for Foreign Affairs, Mr. Kudulur Thor Thordason. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first allow me to congratulate you on this important conference. I am really delighted to see that so many experts and managers from so many countries are taking part in this conference about geothermal district heating system. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to give some opening remarks. I think that one can say that Reykjavik is the birthplace of modern geothermal district heating, and Iceland has for more than a century worked on and invested in its geothermal district heating systems. Geothermal district heating is so much a part of everyday life today in Iceland that most Icelanders, especially the young generation, and now I'm talking about uh, people who are less than 50, <laughs> do not remember or realize the effort that was put into its development. Geothermal district heating has become so much an integrated part of society, society that we almost do not notice it. For the rest of the world, where clean district heating in energy is needed, this is a different story. Heating costs in many countries are high. The CO2 emissions from generating the needed thermal energy are staggering. We don't have to go far to see this reality. About half of the energy used in the European Union is for heating and cooling. By far the largest portion is for heating. And the EU countries get about 70% of their thermal energy from fossil fuels and 20% from biomass. This has remained stable for a decade. But the potential for low temperature geothermal heating is there and should be utilized. Good examples exist in countries such as France, Italy, Germany, Slovakia, Netherlands and Portugal. But there are also great potentials in Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia and Greece. Also in Asia, as we know, Iceland has taken an active part in developing geothermal heating and cooling system in China, where today you find the world's largest geothermal district heating system. In 2014, Iceland received a formal recognition from Cornell University for its leadership in green energy and sustainability. This award was given to Iceland for its accomplishment in the area of technology development, and utilization of geothermal and hydro energy resources in an integrated fashion to create a sustainable future for the country. The geothermal district heating system plays a huge part in this formal recognition. Well, over 80% of the primary energy in Iceland now derives from renewable resources, and here the district heating system plays the biggest part. Today, Iceland is estimated to have saved about $22 billion because of using low temperature geothermal energy for space heating instead of importing coal and oil. And of course, this has saved the atmosphere for millions of tons of CO2. Sustainability is more than just a concept in Icelandic society. Sustainability has shaped the country and laid the groundwork for our prosperity. Our energy infrastructure is unlike any other in the world, and Iceland is a global leader with over 95% of, it, of its electricity and heating provided by renewable geothermal and hydro energy. Iceland's renewable energy represents more than 85% of Iceland's primary energy supply. In contrast to the global average energy supply, where about 80% is derived from fossil fuels. In our common effort to com combat climate change, we need to util utilize all forms of renewable and clean energy. 
Geothermal energy is part of the solution. Low temperature geothermal energy district heating and cooling systems are important in that contest. We know that this form of energy can be widely found and Iceland is open to sharing its success in sustainable energy development and utilization with other countries. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my hope that this event may become a platform for the geothermal district heating sector to come together and share knowledge, experience, good and bad, and to form new partnerships to speed up the development of geothermal district heating systems. Europe will not reach its goals. The world will not reach its goals for emission reduction without a large-scale investment in clean district energy systems, where low-temperature geothermal resources are utilised. Here today, in this room, are the people that can assist with making that happen. I therefore take this opportunity to express my satisfaction with that a whole session of this conference is devoted to the EA grants and the opportunities they offer for funding geothermal district heating projects. As you know, the EEA grants are funded by Iceland, Norway and Liechtenstein. The grants have two goals, to contribute to more equal Europe, both socially and economically, and to strengthen the relations between Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway and the 15 beneficiary countries in Europe. Iceland has, from the outset, placed priority on using the EA grants to support the utilization of geothermal energy, because environmentally sound and reliable central heating is fundamental for social progress and economic well-being. I hope you have a productive conference. There is much to be done and there is little time. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Next, we will hear from Johanna Björk Hansen. Johanna is a board member of Samorka and the director of construction, planning and environment of Mosfeldspar municipality in Iceland since 2006. Johanna, welcome. Esteemed conference participants, as Lovisa told you, my name is Johanna Hansen and uh, I am from Moses Bayer Municipality and I'm a representative of the smaller utility companies in the board. As it happens, Moses Bayer Municipality is a historic landmark for the original utilization of hot water for central district heating in Iceland. As early as 1908, the farmer Stefan at Reykir connected pipes from the hot spring on his land into his farmhouse for heating. The story goes that when the parish priest heard of this daring project, he saddled his horse, rode to Reykir to meet Stefan. The priest begged farmer Stefan not to meddle with the hot water because its origin was unknown. It might even be originated from the devil himself. But Stefan did not listen to the priest. The hot water was nice, and it enhanced the family's living standards. And on to more history. Winston Churchill claimed in his biography that he got the idea to utilize hot water at Reykjavik when he visited the site during World War II in 1941. But that is old false news, long before the internet began with false news. 
Now, some 110 years after Stefan's entrepreneurship, we are planning on opening a historical park in Mosesby to remember uh, the beginning of district heating in Iceland. And we will do this at the very site where all this began. So hopefully, within the next two years, we can open this new park. In Iceland, we're so lucky that 90% of all homes today are connected to central geothermal or district heating. This is a very unique position, and it is important for our nation to minimize our carbon footprint. As you've heard, sustainability has undoubtedly become the most important issue of the 21st century. And if you are to live in harmony on this planet and enhance both current and future potential to meet uh, the, aspects, uh, the needs and aspirations of, our, of humans, we clearly have to do better than we do today. And in this aspect, the energy sector ha as a whole has a very important role to play as it will help maintaining change in a balanced environment and help minimize the exploitation of resources. And I hope that beside learning and getting to know each other here today, that uh, you will enjoy yourselves, have fun, make some memories, because remember, life is short. So please, have a good time here. And I will end this with a short video that I hope you will enjoy. Thank you. Society can change in a short amount of time. Not so long ago, Icelanders were using gas, coal and oil for cooking, lighting and space heating. The first energy transition began in 1904, when the first waterfall was used to produce electricity. Things happened fast after that. Electricity was a household commodity after World War II. The second energy transition began in the 1930s, when Icelanders began utilizing geothermal resources for space heating. During the oil crisis in the 70s, the massive project to provide geothermal district heating for every home was taken on. These projects were expensive for a poor country like Iceland was at the time. Today, we reap the benefits of the decisions made by the generations before us, and the benefits have been great. Iceland went from being one of the poorest countries in the world to one of the richest in quality of life. We have a story to tell in the fight against climate change. 100% renewable energy sources in electricity production and heating. The black coal smoke over our houses has disappeared. The largest part of Iceland's energy needs does not come from fossil fuels, but from green local sources. Once again, we are faced with a challenge. To succeed, we need the third energy transition. We've done it before, not once, but twice. The energy and utility companies have been in the forefront in both energy transitions so far. And we are committed to be there for the third. Infrastructure for electric cars, better electricity system, full utilization of all resource streams, innovation and development, independence from fossil fuels with green local energy, sustainability and water conservation are part of what we strive for every day. We want the next generation to reap the benefits of the work we put in today. We will continue to be a part of the solution in the fight against climate change. Thank you, Johanna. The next speaker is Ruud Sino, the Deputy Director of the Directorate of Sustainable Heating and Subsurface Policy in the Netherlands. Welcome, Ruud. Perfect. 
distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be here um, from the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy. It's my strong belief that in addressing the issues concerning climate change and also in the energy transition, countries need to work together, um, sectors need to work together, people need to work together. And the first step in cooperation, I think, is to get to know each other. So please allow me to dwell a little bit about the Netherlands and the Dutch approach towards climate change and uh, the energy transition. And I do this from a very humble point of view because the Netherlands is a very rich country, but at the moment we are lacking behind in reaching our climate goals and also in our goal to, for renewable energy. In the year 2020, we should have reduced CO2 emissions by 25%, and the estimate is it will be 15%. Uh, and we have very ambitious goals, but uh, the only thing is we have to do it, and we have to realize it. And if we look at renewable energy, we were aiming for 14%, and at the moment we are stuck at 7%. So we're not doing that well. At the same time, other countries look at the Netherlands and think we are doing great things, and that's because we have a climate agreement, which is a typical Dutch invention, and I will go into that. And I will go from the climate agreement to challenges for the built environment, because that's the focus, I think, of this conference, and then the opportunities for geothermal energy, and also what we do in innovation and in international cooperation. Trying to be inviting, because I would like to invite all of you to work together with the Dutch and also we would like the Dutch to work together with your countries. Let's go to the climate agreement and then you see a typical Dutch thing because we have set a goal, a single goal. We are only looking for CO2 emissions and we are looking for megatons, trying to reduce as much as possible. And we have set a goal of 95% uh, reduction in 2050 and a 49% reduction in the year 2030 compared to the year 1990. And then you see a typical Dutch thing, we are a little bit stingy. What we say here is we should do it at the lowest cost possible, so we're looking at the very best competitive solutions and we only think we should spend a half percent of our GDP. And we have been discussing this with our Iceland guests and, and hosts, and they said they have spent 6% of their GDP over the last 30 years, or something like that. So, are we ambitious? I think we are very ambitious in saving money. Uh, if we are ambitious in setting the goals, uh, also we are very ambitious in setting the goals, but are we going to reach those goals? I know it's been filmed, so I should be very careful here, uh, but I have my doubts. Um, also, what we say is when we go to, into uh, an energy transition, we shouldn't exclude any people. It should be affordable still. Energy should be affordable for all levels of society. So everyone should be included. It should be a just transition. And also, we would like to see that there is minimum leakage for, from businesses seeking a refuge abroad because we are going to tax them for CO2 emissions. We don't want to, to see them leave the Netherlands we are looking for a level playing field. So also there, that's the Dutch uh, merchant mind still working here. And also we say, when we do and try to invent new things and seek for new opportunities, this creates new economic activities. Those are very beneficial for the Dutch economy, also for the economy in other countries. So we should maximize economic opportunities. So a lot of things to do. Then the process of coming to a climate agreement, which is, I said, a typical Dutch thing. We like to sit together at a round table involving all stakeholders. So industry was there, the government was there, but also civil society was there. So now we have an agreement and it has broad societal support. That's, that's I think, pretty unique. So there's a lot of opportunities to do things. And it was an independently organized process. It was not just the government saying what needs to be done. Uh, no, it was a very democratic process. All kind of ideas could be brought up and they were under an independently uh, uh, chair who said, okay, this is a good idea, we're going to do that. Also, we had 
an overview of what, what was br brought to the table. It was assessed, it was independently assessed. And we had a step-by-step -step process all the time when we came into difficulties because if you need to do certain things, you need money or you need some ideas about taxation, those are very political sensitive. So we need to check from time to time if we're still on the right path. So we had five sectoral tables, otherwise it would be a very broad discussion. So we took five different tables. One was about electricity, one was about industry, one was about mobility, one about agriculture and land use, and one about built environment. That's the way it was brought together. And then you have a little problem, because I was talking about cooperation, also about cooperation between sectors. And if you're not careful in an approach like this, you leave out the cross-sectoral uh, issues, things like, for instance, the infrastructure you need in the energy transition. Because all the tables were looking at each other and say, okay, you're going to deal with that problem. We'll hear what the outcome will be. And of course, we needed them to work together and seek this out together. You see, we also selected the stakeholders very carefully. They had to be able to put something to the table. It was not there for free riders. I already told you about the independent assessors. We looked at all kinds of things, the impact on our budget, yeah, the half percent of the GDP. We also looked at tax and non-tax burdens for, for industry, if they would still stay in the Netherlands. But also we looked at the income effects for individual households. And this became a very big political debate because Everyone wants us to tell us the true story. What will it cost? And actually, we have no idea. It will cost a lot. Uh, and who is going to pay? Is industry going to pay, or are the individual households going to pay? And of course, half of our parliament said the industry should pay, and the other half said, well, they should pay, but not everything. We should do it in a very smart way, etc., etc. So it's the big debate. And now we are obliged as a government to constantly come out with new figures about what happens to the income effects for individual households. And this is constantly scrutinized now by, by Parliament. On the other hand, of course, we had to look, do we meet the targets? Is it realistic what we are going to do? In the end, if you hear some cynicism, uh, that's my age, I'm 59, then you get a bit cynical, um, also a bit realistic. At the same time, it doesn't matter what I think because everything we are going to do is heading in the right direction. If we want to save energy because we don't want to pay too much for energy, that's fine. If we do it to have a more comfortable home, it's fine. If we do it because of geopolitical issues, it's fine. It all goes in the same direction. In the end, you will use more and more renewable energy and it will help to lessen the CO2 emissions. So I'm very convinced that we're going forward. This is, if we look at, I make now an, I skip to, to um, the energy transition because that's a huge part of, of reducing CO2 emissions. And here you see how energy is used in the Netherlands. A lot goes to industry, but also the built environment is very important. We didn't say they had to do very much about reducing CO2 emissions directly from the built environment, but of course in the built environment, everything comes together because there the consumers live and of course, with their behavior, they also influence the other sectors. So we are using the built environment as a, as a showcase what needs to be done and what can be done. And people can see what kind of new ideas are there. So the built environment is a really important part of our policy to, to reduce CO2 emissions and also to have the energy transition. At the same time, you have to know we had a huge gas field in the northern part of the country, the Groningen gas field. And we have decided to close it down, not because it's not safe, but because it caused too much damage to, to homes and, and uh, buildings, and the situation was no longer in control. People were very worried, and they were right so. So we said, let's do something really drastic. Let's stop the production of gas from the Groningen gas field. And this, of course, there rises in demand to look for alternatives, because otherwise we have to import gas, and that adds to our CO2 footprint. So we are not winning, we are not diminishing the amount of CO2 emissions, we're actually causing more CO2 emissions by closing down the Groningen gas field. So that's another reason to look at the built environment to make progress there. 
In this slide, I, I think I will skip it because I will only look at the built environment, but here, if you, I will leave my presentation behind so you can read it, and also you can find it on the internet what the Dutch Climate Agreement is all about. There are some very drastic measures here. At the same time, I think um, people signed off for this. There is a lot of commitment to, look, to make this possible. Um, also, there's a big role for the horticultural sector because they have been very successful in sustainable heating in the Netherlands. Actually, what we are producing in, in geothermal heat is about one-third of what's produced in Iceland, and everyone can see how huge this business is in Iceland. We don't produce electricity for, with geothermal, but sustainable heat from geothermal sources in the Netherlands is about one-third of what's been produced in Iceland. So it's already quite substantial, and it will be growing exponentially, we think. And also here, the, the horticultural sector has been playing a very leading role because it has been applied in that sector first. And now we're looking to, to broaden the scope and go to the built environment as well. So let's look at the built environment, what has been agreed upon. We should enhance the electricity or the energy efficiency of one and a half million uh, homes and also one million uh, utility buildings, which is quite substantial. And then, of course, you need at uh, insulation. So that's big business, insulating homes and buildings in the Netherlands. Um, and also we have asked our municipalities to do a district by district approach and come up with a plan for sustainable heating. And they have to go literally from home to home and discuss with people what, we, what they are going to do. Will it be all electric? Will it still be gas? Or perhaps uh, not only natural gas, but also green gas or uh, perhaps even hydrogen? Uh, or do we use uh, district heating? Are there enough sources for district heating? And in this, of course, geothermal plays a big role. But they have to discuss it. They have to decide. They have to come up with a plan. And then, of course, we have to realize those plans. Though this is a very bottom-up approach. And actually, we are looking here at Iceland because you've done it like this, I think. Bottom-up, very pragmatic, and we like that approach very much. So we're looking to Iceland to learn a lot from you. Um, also, what's really important that we have uh, a district heating, that we have made a switch from, from high temperature to low temperature district heating, because once you have a low temperature district heating, you have much more uh, opportunities for having the infrastructure there. And infrastructure is key. If we don't have the infrastructure and don't have parties who invest in the infrastructure, it will never work. So this is one of the major challenges we face. So what are our municipalities doing? We have made a graph of it. Uh, we made a distinction between collective, which in Dutch, uh, I'm afraid, but the English term is almost the same, to the left-hand side, and individual systems, and we have uh, a temperature uh, about above 70 degrees, which we call a high temperature, and uh, below 70 degrees, which is the low temperature. And then you get four quadrants, and in each of every one you can see what can be done. Um, and also you see the kind of homes we have in the Netherlands, they are different, so each uh, area needs a different approach. So this is what they are doing. They are trying to assess what can be done, and they will come up with their plans, and we are going to review those plans. Then the geothermal sector in the Netherlands. Um, I already told you it's not that big yet. We have 22 projects at the moment in use, uh, but still there are, in, are some in the pipeline. Uh, we have a very steady um, number of, of projects being realized. Actually, it's two per year. But we have an ambition that it should be 10 times more in the year 2030. So to reach that amount of projects, I think it should double uh, each year. So this is quite, quite a challenge. And in the Netherlands we see geothermal energy, it's been uh, found at uh, the depth between 2,000 and 3,000 meters. Uh, of course we have a lot of experience in drilling for oil and gas, so drilling at that depth is not a problem. Also, we have quite some knowledge about our subsurface, so we know in certain areas that we will find uh, heat and also that there will be enough water to transport the heat. But also, I think 50% of the country has never been explored. So that's still 
a problem, also a problem for the municipalities. And some of them were in our delegation, and actually this is the thing we are discussing. How can we deal with the circumstances like that? Also what we see is a nice trend is that projects become larger and larger, but of course projects becoming larger, also the financial risk is increasing. So we have to take care of that as well. Um, if we look at geothermal in the built environment, I, I think we, it has a substantial uh, potential. At the moment it's uh, about 5%, but it can increase to 15 to even 45% of all the heating we use in, in district heating. So it's a very important source, and I think we're only going to get there if there is a very strong cooperation between built environments and the horticulture sector. They can really help each other out. And I think if we have the district heating uh, systems in place, we need all the sources to feed in in the system and make sure it works properly. So we have a, a strong policy to, to strengthen and accelerate this process. Um, each and every party is doing its, uh, its part of the job. We already have a very good, I think, subsidy and guarantee scheme. But on top of that, we have changed our legislation because our legislation and the Mining Act is actually looking to oil and gas and its, and its production process. And of course, the exploration and production of geothermal energy is totally different. So we changed the law to accommodate that. Also, the sector is investing in industrial standards, making sure that well integrity, the way they drill, the way they maintain the installations, the, the um, competence of the people who are employed, they have made great progress in this. So the sector is strengthened. It's ready for the next jump. Also, we help them to explore the so-called white spots, the 50% of the Netherlands which hasn't been explored and mapped. We do it with the SCAN program, and also we involve our state-owned com company, EBN, which is a participation um, uh, organization always participating in oil and gas projects, but now they are going to participate in geothermal projects as well, bringing all the knowledge of the subsurface, and also they have a big financial uh, position, so they can also help finance projects. And also we have an innovation roadmap because we are constantly looking at improving this process. Um, our subsidy and guarantee scheme, we have a very nice guarantee uh, for drilling, uh, the geological risk, to take away the geological risk, but it only applies in areas where you have a 90% probability of finding heat and water in enough uh, amounts. So we really need to help uh, municipalities and also uh, entrepreneurs that they are in an area where we have a 90% probability. If you don't know, you can't apply for the guarantee scheme. But already a lot of projects have been started underneath this scheme. And then we subsidize, we all take, try to take away the um, non-economical part of projects and you get a lot, around three, three cents or euro cents per uh, uh, unit produced subsidy. And that helps because that takes away the financial risk in exploration and exploitation of projects. Then, Building up the knowledge, I already told you about the SCAN program, we do the seismic survey, we bring in the knowledge from oil and gas, but also we map all the data, we, we have a data repository where you can find all the data of the Dutch subsurface and you can, it's free, it's open, it's out there on the internet, you can apply it and use it in your own projects. Then one recent addition to this is the innovation center we now have in Rijswijk, also originating from Shell, uh, was a, a, a laboratory to, to do tests for oil and gas, but now it's been used for geothermal energy. Um, I think a very nice and, and, and new addition, and what you find there, I will have to see, we have just visited it, but I couldn't remember all of it. Um, what it has is all kind of uh, equipment, a full-size rig is there. They have two drill holes to uh, accommodate anything you would like to, to research. It's all there. All the facilities are there. 
and they are also looking for cooperation also with other countries, bring it to Rijswijk and we can do some joint research, which I think will help each and of our countries. Then I will finish with the challenges. It will always be difficult to have a good match between demand and supply, also in the way we would like to use our subsurface. We would like to integrate greenhouses in the district heating networks. That's also something we're looking at. And we have to scale up, of course, the networks which are already there. We have to make sure it will grow in the future. We are looking at the temperature, try to have lower temperature heat networks because then we have more opportunities to use already existing infrastructure. And of course, we constantly have to look at our rules and regulation. And I will come to a close now. Here's again what we are looking for and what we have to offer as a Dutch society. We have a lot of knowledge in the horticultural sector. We have our Rijswijk Center of Innovation and where you can test things. We have knowledge about our sedimentary system, how to, how to use the subsurface, and we have a lot of knowledge from oil and gas. It's all there. Uh, we, are, on our turn, are looking for opportunities all over the world. If it's already been found out, we don't want to invent it again. So please, let's cooperate, uh, and I think then a bright future is waiting for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sino. I have no doubt your call will be answered here at this conference. It's my pleasure to welcome next to the stage um, Gwyni Johannesson, the Director General of Orkustopnen, the Icelandic National Energy Authority. Gjörðu svo vel, Gwyni. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it's very nice to be here. It's very nice to see this report from the Netherlands. I've had the privilege to follow over the years the, the development of geothermal in the Netherlands, and, and uh, I think that this is a, a very lovely story to tell. And uh, it will be better <laughs> in the future as well. Uh, now, I would say a warm welcome to Iceland, of course. Uh, Iceland is cold, as you have experienced in these days, but inside we, we are feeling pretty good because of the geothermal. Uh, we started to build up our geothermal district heating in the early 30s, and uh, that went uh, well. Uh, we were uh, still heated. We were heating about 40% of the total stock in, in 1970. But then we had the energy crisis. Uh, we didn't know if we were going to have uh, oil, and we didn't use so much gas at that time in the future. And that the prices were going up, we were quite certain of. So this was a, a, the driving forces for, for the big energy transition then was not the climate change or CO2 emissions or anything like that. It was uh, about... Uh, it was about the driving forces were energy security and the economy. And um, it's very interesting to, to look at the, the statistics from this period between 1975 and 1985. That about 4% uh, of the total stock of the district heating in Iceland, of the, of the heating in Iceland was transformed from oil to uh, heating with geothermal. And of course, there were also, at that time, some heating with electricity uh, developed at the time. And this corresponds to a total uh, transformation of the system in 25 years. So the Icelandic example says that the total transmission uh, from, from fossils to renewable can be carried out in 25 years. Well, is that good news? I think so. Especially when it comes to heating systems, which have a big life length. If we have, uh, if we have uh, cars, and, and uh, which is our ne next task here, the cars have a lot, much shorter uh, time, uh, lifetime. 
So that should be should uh, go faster, and it will. I am certain. Now, so 90% of the district heating today is from geothermal. 10% uh, comes from electricity, which is also also renewable in Iceland. And for that, we had to build up an enormous infrastructure. That's also a difference here, that most of the infrastructure for the electrification of the car fleet, we have today, even if we have some investments to do at the, at the very end of the system. But uh, we had to build up, especially in the rural areas, very, very distributed systems. So the longest connection between well and the most remote customer in Iceland is 63 kilometers, which is a, some, some length. Now, I've been working for some years now in the set plan in Europe. And there is always this problem that when politicians and policymakers start to talk about energy, they mean electricity. They forgot about heat. And then there was an English professor coming and saying that heat is six times more important than electricity in our, our energy transition. We also know that uh, about 50% of the total globally primary energy, mostly from fossil fuels, is used for producing low quality heat. So we are, we are using very high quality energy to produce low quality heat, where we should be trying to use the low quality sources that we have available, like geothermal, but also other sources from solar or whatever. And this uh, generating electricity has the whole focus of the policy makers. And we can see it that there is a very big emphasis on smart grids. And when I get tired of this and want to provoke them, I say there are no smart grids, there are only stupid grids. But there are smart energy networks where you combine all the possible uh, sources together to use the best, to use the right sources for the right purpose. Everything else is stupid. Uh, so the district heating system with its reservoir tanks is a communication platform for storing and utilizing energy from different sources. And for me, it's absolutely clear that without building out district heating system and district cooling systems and, and, uh, and, and means for storage, we will not be able to, to uh, uh, mitigate the climate change uh, taking place. Uh, this is one of our most important measures to build out the, these systems because they are so vital in providing the flexibility needed to use the possible uh, resources at hand. And I sometimes, when I have looked at like the development in Sweden, but they have no geothermal energy at all. Or, well, they have the shallow geothermal they use for heat pumps. Uh, we can say that a district heating system with flexible feeding possibilities, it can reduce the carbon footprint by 70%. The remaining 30% we can take care of if we have a geothermal source. So the most important is to get the geothermal district, is to get the district heating in place. Then we look for the sources, and we will find sources. Hopefully, as much geothermal as possible. And also, there is this passive house uh, discussion in Europe, which I call a high-quality energy mousetrap, because we invest huge money into building very, very effective houses. And it's an engineering artwork. And I was a professor in building physics and building engineering before, so I, I know the joy of it. But, uh, and I'm also convinced that our buildings should be well insulated and energy effective. But there should be a sound balance between the investment in the building shell and the system to provide heat. And that's not what we see because we are in investing so much in these houses that the, the energy used for heating is becoming small. There is no economical basis for putting up the, the uh, district heating. And what pe do people use? They use gas and electricity. So they are stuck with fossil and 
uh, and, and mostly not renewable sources for a very long time. And uh, the flexibility of the energy system is lost, and the carbon footprint will actually rise. And we have also development around the world. I think the foreign minister, I'm sorry, I went to the Harpa from the beginning for this conference, so I came in late here. Uh, uh, but I heard that he was mentioning China. And uh, the Sino-Icelandic cooperation on geothermal district heating has now led to more than 50 million square meters of floor area with geothermal. And I think that more than 300 million square meters, or firkant meters, as we say in, in, in uh, Dutch, that's a beautiful word, uh, has been contracted. And now the Chinese government has issued a directive to explore the utilization of geothermal in 26 major cities. And most of the cities, they have good resources. And the new clean megacity, Xiong'an, uh, which is going to be built in China, has been placed in an area with the best geothermal source around Beijing. So it's absolutely clear what the Chinese authorities look for in the future for their, for their heating. And now, on the 11th of November, the Sino-Icelandic geothermal training program with 40 students is planned to take off in Beijing uh, in November this year. 11th of November this year. So this uh, cooperation uh, from I between Iceland and China, China is leading to a far bigger impact on the carbon footprint in the world than what we could do here in our own country. So this is very important for Iceland and for Europe to not look at our, ourselves doing it for our economy, but as a role model for the rest of the world. And in, in Europe, we have the SET plan. We have uh, an implementation group for renewable technologies. And now we managed to get geothermal in there. There is a plan for R&D and demonstration projects in the next years to come with about, uh, uh, pl uh, we're planning projects for about 1 billion euro. And already uh, the Geothermica, which is a cooperation platform for co-funding between Iceland, Netherlands, and other countries, has uh, been in the first call, come up to uh, uh, over 50 million euro in, in project money, and, and the second call will bring us closer to the 100. So even if we th think it's a lot of money, it's easily spent when many countries come together. And uh, we can say that geothermal projects in Europe now are reaching the, uh, the present, uh, the, the new, uh, latest, and the, and the present projects are uh, at a level of about three, 400 million euro. And we have the EA grants, which are also very important. It's, uh, 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 and Orkostovnen, the, the National Energy Authority I come from, has been uh, working on this, uh, collaborating uh, with the countries that are eligible. And they are countries like Bulgaria, Croatia, but uh, Romania and uh, Poland and, and other countries that are, are uh, some uh, the emerging economies in and around Europe. And uh, this has been successful to bring geothermal into use, and many of these countries have good geothermal sources, especially for heating, and they have the demand for heating. And there will be a special session on EA grants, which will come after the break in Hall B and during lunchtime. And Orkostovn or has organized a special networking lunch for those interested, so you're very welcome. Thank you. Next up is the newly appointed, manage, newly appointed Managing Director of Veitur Utilities here in Reykjavik, Gestur Pietursson. Before joining the utility business, he was the CEO of Elkem Iceland. Welcome to the stage, Gestur.
Good morning. Pleasure being here today with you all. Uh, what I wanted to cover today is basically how growth mindset and innovation will basically take us forward. And not only that, just take us forward, but also grow in a true, sustainable way. And to be able to grow in a true, sustainable way, we need to have the three pillars. The environmental effects, the society, and the economics. And I must stress the fact that for a true, long-term sustainability, our solutions need to be at equal cost or lower than the alternative, just to stress that fact. Based on my information today, the European population enjoying district heating uh, from geothermal sources is around 1.5%. That is the current situation, based on my information. However, based on the same information source, about 25% should be able to enjoy that. So there's a big gap. So what are we going to do about it? It's us that will do something about it. And with a growth mindset and innovation, we will close that gap. So this gap is nothing but an invitation for us and our industry to embrace innovation. As Icelanders, we're quite proud of our history, even though our forefathers and foremothers were basically just tax evading liberalists from Norway. But however, we are equally as proud of our history when it comes to geothermal district heating. We can see improvements in quality of life after the installment of the district heating systems. We can see improvements in health. For example, in 1937, about 22% of the population in Reykjavik was suffering from severe flu symptoms and cold symptoms. In 1948, that came down to 4%. We could see visible improvements in air quality. The dust was no longer on the ground, the smoke was no longer over the, the town, etc. And we can see, as the Minister of Foreign Affairs pointed out, an improvement on the trade balance. 22 billion US dollars saved since 1960. I could do with a little bit of that money. And also, we must not forget, as our industry grows, we create jobs, both directly and indirectly. And just to give you an example, what, what our contribution here in Iceland is, is basically when you look at the capital expenditure budget of the Icelandic government for 2020, it's about 64 billion Icelandic kronas. The capital expenditure budget for to utilities alone is 9 billion, 14%. So we have been allowed to grow in a sustainable manner, and as such, we can actually provide support to society when we have a downturn because we need to maintain our utilities and also having a captive customer base that also allows us to have a steady flow of income. As long as we are able to tell our customers that our service is at equal cost or lower versus the alternative. But there are also some challenges. For example, the district heating system created huge challenges with regards to potatoes here in Iceland. We couldn't store them any longer in our basements because they became too hot. But not being able to store the potatoes was not such a big challenge because here we are today. We did not starve. We just found another solution for that. And just to give you an insight, a challenge, a change is always challenging, both on a national level, global level, or even on a personal level. You can all relate to the fact that when you have made plans yourselves about doing something in the afternoon, after work, and you come home and your children, your friends, or your spouse has made other plans, and you all get the feeling of, oh no. Am I making any sense here? Is this something that you have ever experienced before? 
So, when even, so this actually becomes even more challenging on a national level. There was actually a public vote in Reykjavik about whether we should have a district heating system or not. And you can see a politician here making, it's a completely ludicrous idea. Politicians today, they still use these phrases when it comes to change. And politicians are human beings just like us. So we need to respect the fact. And we need to work with that. So when it comes to for the current situation and the future, we are faced with some global megatrends that are not decided by nations, they are not decided by political parties. This is actually, you know, these are the megatrends decided by the global community. The megatrends of sustainability, energy demand growth, etc., the rapid urbanization, and you can see that there is a very big place for our industry going forward. These megatrends, they create solutions. This is, these, this is basically a business opportunity, if I would like to put it. I would like to put it that, that way. And it, it is our responsibility to both provide solutions to the known specific needs of our customers, but also come up with solutions that our customers don't know about today that would be useful. That is innovation. So when it comes to growing our industry from 1.5% in Europe to 25%, we can look at continuous improvement. Yes, we could set targets and objectives. However, that will not close the gap in time. We need to innovate. We need to go into uncharted territory. When you are working with continuous improvement, you are working with a map. You are working with known facts. You are navigating within an area that others have mapped before you. But going forward and closing the gap, we need a compass. We need to have the um, courage to go into uncharted territory. Uncharted territory with regards to technology. Uncharted territory with regards to business offerings. So that is the way how we, to do it. For some people that can be scary. It's like sticking your head between the jaws of a uh, crocodile. But however, we must listen to the people that are willing to go outside of the boundaries of the map. And we must be willing also to at least try to follow them. And in worst case, we can just back out because when you go into uncharted territory with competent people, you start mapping that territory. That means that we can easily back out. I can tell you that because I'm a, an outdoors person. So being an engineer, we like to put things into boxes because then we can stack them up. So going forward with regards to innovation and growth mindset, we have in general, 10 types of innovation. So this is something that can help us. This is something that can help us think outside of the box. And not only that, this is something that can help us allow other industry to inspire us. The food industry, the transportation industry, the car industry, banking industry, etc. Because our business model is not just about the technology going forward. There's a lot of other things that we can do. I don't know them, but what I'm saying here is something we should be encouraged of going forward because others have done it and succeeded. And if they can do it, we can do it also, but better. So in closing, what I would like to say here when it comes to going forward with a growth mindset and innovation, we need to close a gap. There's a huge opportunity between 1.5% and 25%. This is an opportunity that has been given to us. So, going forward, I really look forward working with you all today, tomorrow, and also in the coming future to close this gap and create innovative solutions and inspiring solutions with all of you. Thank you.
Thank you, Gester. Now we will hear from uh, Werner Lutsch, who is the president of Euroheat and Power and the managing director and CEO of AGFW. Welcome. Well, thanks a lot and uh, thanks for the invitation, having the opportunity to speak a little bit about the EU, the European things of uh, doing or bringing district energy into all the states in Europe. And uh, first of all, most of you know us, but um, who are we? First of all, the International Association for District Heating and Cooling, situated in Brussels, in Belgium, with uh, around about 100 members from more than 100, uh, more than uh, 30 countries. And uh, these are national district heating and cooling associ associations like our German association, the Danish association, the Swedish association, and so on. But also utilities, manufacturers, universities, at research institutes and consultancies. And uh, what we are doing, you all know, probably at advocacy and representation for the business, knowledge and visibility and research and innovation. So <clears throat> our point of view, if we are talking about our businesses, we say no energy transition without sustainable cities, no sustainable cities without sustainable heating and cooling, and no sustainable heating and cooling without district energy. Now, <clears throat> if you look at Brussels, district heating and cooling now is in the center of the European policy debate. But this was not always this way. Fifteen years ago in the EU, energy, the, this was an internal market issue in the different countries. So two issues triggered a change of the status quo and brought energy to the heart of the political debate. It was uh, energy security and the realization of the threat brought by the dependence on gas imports from different countries. A scientific consensus that global warming uh, at the moment is occurring and well, the first generation EU energy and climate targets came in 2007. At the time, 2020, at that time, 2020, seemed to be far away. Now, in the past years, the EU has uh, renewed its energy and climate commitments uh, through the adoption of various documents and the new framework set a trajectory between 2020 and 2030 to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions, as you can see here, uh, to increase the share of renewables and uh, energy efficiency. They put the EU on the way to achieve the transformation towards a low carbon economy uh, detailed in the 2050 long-term strategy, including also net zero greenhouse gas emissions uh, scenarios. Achieving these targets imply, of course, radical changes to our energy systems, including the heating and cooling sector, of course. Now, the heating and cooling sector, 
and low carbon economy. Well, <clears throat> as you all know, and uh, all over Europe, um, you will find out that heating and cooling represents 50% of the total annual energy consumption. We focused during the last years just on electricity. But, well, the EU has set itself ambitious climate and energy targets to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions, so be more sustainable in the long term. The way we are doing to deal with heat, I think, is fundamental to the success of decarbonization of the societies. And as heat, as I said, represents more than 50% of the total annual energy consumption in all the countries. There is no sustainable society or low carbon economy without sustainable heating and cooling. That's what we believe. So, we did, I think, a lot on that, and uh, nevertheless, it has been a quite long journey to put heating and cooling at the center of the EU, EU agenda. And, um, well, in 2016, uh, the EU Commission published the first ever European heating and cooling strategy. And the uh, heating and cooling strategy clearly reconditioned and qualified the importance of the thermal energy applications in general and the potential contribution of district heating and cooling in particular. So it set the stage for the next um, big milestones on our journey, the establishment of an EU-level regulatory uh, framework for heating and cooling to the explicit inclusion of the sector in the recently adopted clean energy for all European package. The sector finally got recognition and support of the European Commission, and uh, nevertheless, the support was not unconditional. In the different texts, the European Commission had asked for assurances, greater transparency, customer uh, empowerment, efficiency, and renewable object ob objectives. And it brings us, this brings us to the clean energy package. So the clean energy package for you, all Europeans package was first published um, in uh, 2016 in November. We think uh, it's a puzzle composed of uh, eight proposals to, con uh, to concre concretize <clears throat> the concept of the energy union uh, outlined in a communication from 2015. The most important text is for district heating and cooling sector are the renewable energy uh, directive followed by the energy efficiency directive and the European performance of buildings directive. <clears throat> they are building up uh, on existing legislative frameworks bringing new elements to achieve the goals of uh, the energy union and transition to low carbon economies. After over, over two years of negotiations, the new pieces of leg legislation were adopted um, at 
the end of 2018. All in all, they induced well for our industry. The new regulatory framework uh, is one our business can live with and is importantly, district heating is clearly proposed uh, as, an, as a sector with, with an important role uh, to the European energy transition. So I think uh, now we've reached the first target. We will see what will follow during the next years. The ultimate destination in 2050, it is evident that business as usual is not an option if we want to achieve the targets we set. The incoming commission, um, President Ursula von der Leyen has talked of the need to accelerate the European energy transition to the uh, creation of uh, an European Green Deal. District heating and cooling needs to continue to affirm its place in the decarbonization of the system. Heat is key in the transition, uh, so either we meet this challenge of the energy transition will simply not be possible. The district heating or district energy sector will need to show that it has the power to deliver. So uh, after discussions uh, with our board of directors over the past years at Euroheat and Power, we announced a commitment to decarbonize our networks in Europe before 2050. I hope this sends a clear message about the scale of intentions and our readiness to act, to take leadership and responsibility. District heating and cooling is not only a great way to deliver low carbon heat, it is also a powerful tool that allows us to create a smarter, more integrated overall energy system. But of course, our business exists within a framework and uh, we need, of course, the right rules. Well, <clears throat> and finally, I think it's important to recognize the crucial role of the cities. They will play in shaping the future of our business. In the end, they are the ones, our networks are intended to serve. So in order to get a vision of where we need to go, we've started asking them what they need. By the way, I don't think we have Reykjavik on our map yet, so let's change this as soon as possible. In any case, uh, as you can see, we have lots of work to do, but the future looks bright and let's make it happen. And therefore, I think we have a video here and I hope we can Just press what? Yeah. Thank you. Lahti will be carbon neutral by 2025 and our aim is to be completely emission free by 2050. This heating and cooling has played a major role in the climate mitigation work of our city. Damit uh, werden die Ziele 
in Sachen der Umwelt- und Energiepolitik der Stadt Villach sehr, sehr gut mit Fernwärme unterstützt. A key part of our green transformation is our collective district heating system. It plays a central role in the city today. Vilnius is proud to have a well-developed district heating system, which provides high-quality heat with the lowest impact on environment. Tutto il tema della decarbonizzazione che una città come la nostra ha bene in mente come obiettivo per il futuro della sua rete di teleriscaldamento. Il secondo ragionamento invece poggia sul fatto che abbiamo, dobbiamo avere un impegno morale ma concreto nei confronti. Il modernaio slide è close part priekšnoteikumu effektivai politikai energijsjoma. Uns eine deutliche Steigerung der Effizienz, aber vor allen Dingen auch sukzessive den Einsatz CO2 neutraler Energieträger. In fact, our district heating system serves as a hub for reuse of whatever sources of energy we have available in the city. In transition of district heating will bring us closer to meet our climate goals. Et puis à terme, je n'ai aucun doute, on arrivera à un réseau qui soit 100% renouvelable et de récupération. Après tout, nous sommes tous connectés. After all, we are all connected. Après tout, nous sommes tous connectés. Now we are all connected. Thank you. It was really wonderful to hear all the beautiful languages of Europe. Different countries, different people, but all, we're all working towards the same goal. But last, but certainly not the least, Emma Coker will take the stage. She's an analyst at Bloomberg New Energy Finance in the heating and cooling team. Welcome, Emma. Thank you very much. It's a um, pleasure to be here to round out this morning's session. And I know I'm now standing in the way of you and a coffee, so hopefully I'll um, keep it interesting as the very last. So my presentation is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to start first by just taking a step backwards and looking at kind of heating and cooling more generally and then district's heating's role. So the reason we're all here today and what has been pointed out in previous sessions is that residential and commercial buildings use a lot of energy. And as we saw for European households, 79% of that was for heating and hot water alone. But unfortunately, the majority of this is still coal, oil and gas. But the pressure is building. So also being from a small nation, New Zealand, I couldn't help but quote my own Prime Minister when she said, climate change is the greatest threat facing the world, and she urged world leaders not to be on the wrong side of that. And I think it's useful to say it's not just policymakers who are trying to change this. Companies and customers are more and more demanding that we decarbonise heating alongside the, the wider energy transition. So where do I fit in? So as mentioned, I'm an analyst at Bloomberg NEF. We research the clean energy transition. For us, what that used to mean a few years ago was which of the technologies in the power sector are going to win. Is it going to be wind? Is it going to be solar? Is it going to be geothermal? But as you saw from the pie chart in the beginning, if we don't include heating and cooling, we're ignoring a massive chunk of the energy usage. And so I sit down in the corner in the little heat icon. So my team was founded at the end of the last year to look specifically at how we can decarbonise heat. So that's the question, the big question, how can we decarbonise? And we like to think of it as three main pathways. So electrification, green gases and district heating. When we say electrification, what we mean is that households plug into the power grid and that the power grid continues to decarbonise with intermittent renewables, and households use either a heat pump or direct electric heating. 
When we talk about the green gas pathway, what we're talking about is primarily biogases and hydrogen, and hopefully using the existing natural gas infrastructure if possible, which means households would continue to use their gas boilers if they're compatible. But that's a really big if. And finally, what I'm gonna focus on today District heating. So I don't need to tell this crowd, but how we think about district heating, and I'd love to be corrected if this is wrong, is we think about it as effectively mini grids that supply hot water around a network for households to use as space heating and hot water. So where is it being produced? Our company takes a global focus. And as you can see, two countries dominate. So Russia and China, and unfortunately, the rest kind of pitters out. When we think about it in terms of heat supply, in Europe, it was 9% of total heat supply. If we look globally, this decreases to 7%. So we've got a bit of a long way to go. But you can't come to Iceland and you can't be from a small nation unless you look at something per capita. So as you can see, if we look per capita, ding, ding, ding. Iceland is, of course, number one. And it's number one for two reasons. It's number one because of the size of this and the fact it can primarily supply uh, heating and hot water for the households with district heating. But it's also an exception because of geothermal. And as we've just heard, the potential is 25% for Europe. But unfortunately, that is not being realised. And it gets even worse if we look globally. So if we look globally, 85% of networks still rely on coal, oil and gas. So you might be taking a step back and thinking, why have we included district heating as one of our decarbonisation options, when obviously right now it's not exactly the cleanest picture? Well, we think there are options, and the first and foremost for district heating is changing the heat source. But changing the heat source is also going to require a lot of digitalisation. Unfortunately, the majority of district heating networks today are stupid, as it was quoted this morning, not my words, but could benefit from smarter digitalisation. In addition, when we say smart homes, what we mean is how households and industry off-takers can be used as both off-takers and suppliers to the network as demand response and sector coupling. So, how do we change the heat source? Is it easy? Well, one thing is it's becoming easier. So, from the very first networks in New York and Paris, which were steam fueled at a very high temperature and very inefficient in concrete pipes, we've come a long way. So, not only has efficiency been rising, but the supply temperature has been decreasing. And we care about this a lot because it influences what supply sources can supply your network. So at a lower temperature, what can it be? And I'm sure a number of you sitting in this room either manage or know schemes that already integrate some of these sources. So heat pumps are a big one we hear about a lot. Using waste heat from things like data centres or industrial heat recovery is another. Tube stations even, London loves a good tube station kind of waste heat recycling, and finally biomass, but th this is not an exclusive list. So as I'm standing here today, people are trying to pick, and they're trying to understand what this is going to look like in 2050. And one of the first people to do this was the Heat Roadmap Europe. So the Heat Roadmap Europe ultimately said a third, a third, a third. In 2050, it will be district heating networks supplied by clean CHPs. So when we say clean CHPs, we mean biomass, biogas, and other sources. Excess heat from industry, or, or waste heat recovery, it's also referred to, and large-scale heat pumps. They're going to be the big players. But sometimes it's worth looking at what we are here, oh, sorry, what we look at, look, oh my goodness, what the networks look like today. So you know this, right? They're built with one supply source in mind. They're a large scale, typically CHP. There's a number of off takers and you size the network for that. So how do we go from a network that looks like that to a network that looks like this? And this is kind of multiple intermittent supply sources at different temperatures and different availabilities. And households and industrial players start playing the role as both off takers and supplying back to the grid. 
And that's something we think digitalisation can play a role in. But also, it's worth noting that district heating is not alone on this journey. If we can think about the fact that the heat sector is one of the slowest to transition in any kind of positive way, it is because we can learn from other sectors. So the power sector and the transport sector have been doing just that. They've been integrating multiple sources of renewables. So how can district heating learn? It's also useful to understand how the supply sources themselves have been developing. So I've picked a couple just to give examples. So heat pumps, as I mentioned, are something that we hear about a lot, and that's because they can play two fundamental roles in district heating. A large industrial scale heat pump can effectively replace the CHP, so the example on the left, where it becomes the sole supply source to the network. But, and more and more commonly, they're being referred to as effectively a heat interface unit, but in the home where you use low temperature waste heat as your main supply source for the networks. So maybe 20, 30 degrees, and the heat pumps sit within the homes to boost that temperature up to the temperature for a nice warm shower or for your heat hot water that comes out of your taps. So why does not every home have a heat pump today? Or why are we not using these in the networks kind of as a standardised rollout? Well, part of the issue is that they suffer from high upfront costs. But the saving grace for this is that annual sales of heat pumps in Europe are rising. So we've seen kind of the last 10 years sales year on year in Europe increase. And what, the reason why we care about that is because we think the more and more that gets sold will a, encourage learnings in the sectors, which will probably result in cost declines, but it will also mean standardised business models will be rolled out. The other thing to look at if we're talking about heat pumps is the cost of electricity. So here's my plug for my own company, but we've been looking for at levelised cost of electricity for a number of years, and I've just kind of given 10 years as a picture. What this looks like is that solar and wind have been declining year on year, and we actually forecast that decline to carry on. So what does that mean? It means heat pumps are going to become cheaper and cheaper to operate, and therefore they're likely to be easier to integrate into a district heating grid. So that was one potential supply source. What about green gases? Now, I don't know if you guys hear this a lot, but we are inundated with questions about what the future of gas is going to look like. And one of them is biogas. So I thought I would show this chart. It effectively says biogas production globally has been growing year on year, and particularly in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So EMEA, the kind of top chart, part of the chart. But although this chart looks great and it does look like it's a significant proportion, if you compare this to global natural gas production, it's actually still less than 1%. So it's got a long way to go. One thing, it's not all doom and gloom. One thing we think is that scale could make it competitive. So at the moment, there are a number of localised sites, but what we think is bigger sites and technological advancements and anaerobic digesters could in fact mean some of these uh, supply sources into biogas or, or feedstocks could actually start competing with natural gas. So crop residue is a great example. If crop residue can see the scale that we think it can reach on a large scale production site, it can actually start competing with, in particular, Europe and Asian natural gas. Unfortunately, Henry Harb or US gas is still very much the cheapest, but this may well change. But how do we go from today, where it's super localised and small, to large scale production? Well, governments are having a bit of a role. And so, as you can see, European, different European countries have added biomass and biogas production targets and mandates into their climate change goals. So, so France and Germany have both a percentage of their gas grid they expect to be biogases by 2030. And so this could help with the scale. So to wrap this up, although I presented these pathways as kind of binary and, and independently competing against each other, it probably looks 
a little bit more like this. So district heating gets to reap the benefits of the fact it's a pathway in and of itself, but it can use both other pathways as its supply sources. So district heating not only needs to focus on itself, but it needs to understand how these other sectors are developing to understand how it can carve its own place in a new decarbonised world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emma, and thank you to all the presenters. We have now come to the conclusion of the opening session. Now we will grab a coffee to freshen up before the rest of the conference. Just to remind you of a few practical things, the conference agenda can be found on the website, sdec.is, or on the conference app. Um, you download an app called Guidebook and look for SDEC 2019 under Guides. We decided not to have a printed out version to reduce waste. Um, this is Hall A. Hall B will be created during the break, so it will be on the other side. And Hall G is upstairs, so you just go to the lobby and take the stairs up or follow the instructions on the screens. On the behalf of the hosts and sponsors, I wish you a great conference, and the knowledge and networks you create here will help you take the next steps towards the future, enhancing the possibilities of district heating. Thank you very much.